Hi, uh, my name is Tsepang, uh, like they said. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the steps that are taken when you build a robust executable. Am I? Oh, I must be closer, okay. Um, I propose this talk knowing that um, it was rather ambitious because I've never worked on a compiler before. So, uh, and uh, at this point, if, if I get any of the details right, it would be good if some of the more knowledgeable people can approach me afterwards. But otherwise, yeah, just a bit of a disclaimer. So, um, anyways, yeah, interestingly, I just wanted to mention it. I met, I met two people yesterday actually who are like, let's say way ahead. I met somebody who works on a V8, well, who used to work on a V8 engine with a Google team, another one who's a macro expert, which was quite interesting because they were talking about some of the steps, like, wow, actually, those are the people who should actually give the talk. But anyways, so, anyways, um, about me, I did some, I studied electronics uh, formally, and yeah, I was a pen, Python uh, fan for a while, but now for some reason I chose Rust. I actually don't even remember why, but I actually quite enjoy it. I think it's very, very well designed. Yeah, I work for it's a small team. I work for a small team in Johannesburg. Yeah, we actually, we built, yeah, we built a distributed data framework. So, yeah, so, and it would actually be interesting to know what other companies on the continent do something like this, where they actually have full-time as developers working, working on in production. So, yeah, anyways, yeah, let's, let's get uh, to the, actually, the steps. So, this is sort of an overview. This is... This is what happens when you actually get to, to produce a working ex executable. Uh, like, uh, if you look at that, the first step is actually passing the source code. And then when you pass the source code, you produce what is called an AST. It's called an abstract, abstract syntax uh, tree. And the second step there is AST processing. I actually don't know what the correct term for what is, I'm gonna show you what's going on actually with AST process, but I don't know what is the, the, normal, the normal name for the steps involved, but yeah, somebody can tell me a bit later. And then anyway, so there's, there's a few steps there, lowering, HIR, type checking, lowering to MIR, borrow checking, translation to LLVM, IR, code generation, linking. We'll get to, to all those. So first step is passing. So with passing, um, the source code is turned into something like a, it's like a meaningful structure. So it just takes, basically it takes a raw text and then turns into something meaningful, which is uh, called the EST. And example, it, it, creates, it creates a bunch of parts called tokens, and this is just a few examples there. Let me see, stack field, wet loss, block, or whatever. There's, there's actually like a bunch of them, like dozens. And what you see there, what's written there is actually types, type names in the compiler, which is like, it's, they are actually internal details. They can change any time. Nobody should rely on this kind of code, but they are the kind of things that I came across as I was looking at this. And yeah, okay. So we're done with uh, passing, and then we get to AST processing. So there's a bunch of, once, once you actually have that AST, there's, there are things that you do to it. Uh, example is code elimination. And then we'll get, to, we'll get to those, and then macro expansion name resolution. Note that this, they are, they, they are, they are not necessarily uh, sequential, as in one happens and then one, 
like like you don't do content elimination and then macro expansion and then name resolution like they are sort of interchangeable so you actually have to look at the code to know exactly what the steps are yeah so talking about uh, code elimination this is if you have a C, C++ background, this is where the if devs, they're like, it's like an equivalent of if devs where, yeah, this is code, what is it? They call it code conditional, conditional com compilation. So that is where yeah, in your C, C, C++, you get your if devs and things like that. So <clears throat> it is nice because code conditional Compilation is nice because you can keep everything in, in one code base. You don't have to have, okay, this, this part is actually for, for this architecture, this part is another architecture. You can just have them in the code, which simplifies, I guess, uh, debugging. It's also nicer when things that are related are in, in one place. Yeah, and, and here's an example of a conditional compilation where you'd use a CFG as an example where you want to compile code for, for Windows. In, in, in such a case, okay, let's, let, let's just look at an example. This is an example from some code that I actually wrote uh, from some crate. So what you'll see that is that uh, you see that second line there. That second line there says CFG Windows. It means that ANSI term enable ANSI support and rep will not compile on Linux. So whenever, whenever you build this for Linux, not compile on Linux, but compile for Linux because remember we have uh, cross compilation. So what's happening there is that when you compile for Linux, it's going to be like that, that code does not exist, that ANSI term. So it's only, it's only useful for Windows. So the reason I actually did this is to add color support for Windows. It's like by default, you don't, you don't actually get color out of it. So you have to do, it feels like a hack actually. You have to do something like this. Because in, Windows is quite different from Unix, right? Anyways, uh, moving on. And then remember there's a few steps. There's now macro expansion, which is kind of a, it's kind of a big topic. So I, this, there's three forms that I came across. There's a derive, which is, which is one example of a derive uh, macro is when you want to automatically print out debug information from your, from your code. So all you do, you just do, for example, a derive debug, and then whenever you print line that and then tell it to give you debug information, you get all of these things for free. That is one example. And then you get the second example, which is function-like. Uh, this one is quite common. Everybody comes across it. Big example is the print line. That's, a, that's also a macro. And then you also have the attribute, the attribute form, which is I encounter it when I write code with Structop, which I'm actually a fan of. Um, Struct op is, is, is a crate that's actually built on top of clap, which does a command line passing, command line interface passing. Anyways, so here's an example of a macro expansion. So you have an asset there, asset, asset EQ, that's, this actually makes your code panic, for example, if, if your things are not, the things that you're comparing are not equal. So, this one will definitely succeed because we, we all know and believe that one equals one, right? So anyways, and then this is, this is actually what happens. So macro expansion takes that bit of code and then creates this, and this is actually just a snippet of it. It's quite, it's quite, it makes, it's quite hard to read, right? But yeah, this is, this was given. You can try to make sense of what's happening. Like you can see there, for example, it's a match statement. You're comparing left and right values, and it's going to panic with a message, with that message that you see a session failed if, if there's problems. Well, if both sides are not equal. 
Anyways, uh, moving on to with, with macro expansion. Here's an example from Structopt. You see, you get simple, nice code like that that actually gets degenerated into this. This is sort of beautified because the stuff is all, is all over the place. So I just put it together for readability. So basically, the, you, are, you are telling it to accept a long option. A long option is that, is that thing in command line interfaces where you do like a dash dash. So if you're going to give the command, for example, blah command dash dash ignore untracked, and then you basically create that the variable called ignore untracked. And then this is, this is the one that's going to tell you that it's actually defined on the command line, and then you can act on it. And that's the help string. And then this is pretty much the code that it generates. She's quite less comfortable to type, but there it is. So yeah, this is a macro expansion. Those are just small examples of what's happening. Okay. So this is uh, another, another step. Uh, it's called name resolution. So Rust allows you to do, to use the same names for like multiple things, like things are not, that are not the same type. Like this is pretty much for convenience. I mean, if you take a look at that example, you, you see, we use the same name X for multiple things. We, we, we create a type called X, and then we also, and then we create a variable called X as well. That will actually com compile. So what name resolution does, it, that it looks at that code and then notices that they are actually not the same thing. So it's going to give them different names. That's, that's uh, pretty much what it does. I actually took this example from the compiler guide. Um, it's called the Rusty guide or something like that. Okay. So it does also variable shadowing. You know what variable shadowing is? is you can, for example, add on to that and say let y is equals to whatever type or even the same type or whatever, and then the compiler accept it, accepts it. So it handles cases like that. Some, not all languages can handle that, by the way, which I find quite convenient. And then it will also do things, because it knows about names, it's going to do things like typo, typo fixes, like it can tell if your variable name is maybe close to another one that is in scope, and then it's going to give you that. And then it also gives you suggestions for trace to import. You've seen, you've seen how Rust error message, how good they are. They actually give you those kinds of suggestions, like where you try to use a type but you don't actually have a trait that, that defines that type. Yeah, you don't have the, the, the trait that it defines that type in scope. So it will give you suggestions for that, which is, which is quite cool. OK. Anyways, uh, moving on. So from the AST, there is a step called lowering. Anyways, uh, what, is, uh, what it does, it lowers to HR. HIR. HIR is a high level intermediate representation of the compiler. So it sort of takes your RAS, your RAS code and then removes all of the conveniences, all of the sugar and things like that. And then it takes it into sort of a raw form, which is easier to process for, for your compiler. So, um, yeah, so yeah, like I said, yeah, the ASC is converting to. Uh, HR and then HR is also where type type checking is quite important. Type checking happens because yeah, it's easier to work on something, a more simple representation. So these are just the commands. If you wanted to see the output of what HIR looks like, that is the that's, that's what the commands look like. So you'll give it. You go into your create direc directory and then run that HIR, and you'll later see what the output actually looks like. I don't know why they use the name unpretty, actually. And I don't think it has to do with the look of the code. It's, it's, it's quite curious. <coughs> Anyways, um, moving on, uh, I want to digress just a little bit and talk about uh, risk 5 risk 5 is a target that I chose for for the output of the code, because 
I wanted to learn a bit more about it. It's actually a new ISA. ISA is, is actually an instruction set architecture. ISA is like an example of a ISA. I think the most famous is x86. And you also have ARM. So RIS-5 is like a sort of a newborn competitor in the field. So I find it nice because I like the, well, <laughs> reading the motivation for it actually. The design is, is good and the people actually learn from the, from the issues in the design of the alternative ISAs, so, which is cool. It's also, it's also Libra, so you don't have to pay royalties and licensing fees and things like that to use it. Which is which is actually cool. It allows because because it allows it allows a lot of people. Well, you must be motivated, right? But it allows a lot of people to actually participate in uh, processor design, which which normally you actually have to pay a hefty fee or whatever to to be able to do it. So, which also fosters it also fosters innovation, right? I mean. If you look at open source, for example, which, which was an inspiration for make, part of the inspiration of making it open. So uh, I wanted also to note that, that uh, there is RAS, RAS support, of course, for RIS-5, but it doesn't have uh, lib standard support. So you won't be able, for example, to run it on, on Linux. So it's all bare metal at the moment. OK, so sort of an intro to RIS-5. There's uh, three basic forms. So there's a 32-bit, 64-bit, 128-bit. Bit. And yeah, these are called instruction sets, basic, basic instruction sets. These are, these are the things that, that you have to implement for it to be called a RIS-5, RIS because there's actually a standard out there and then everything else it's it's a modular design so everything else is optional you only need to implement this things and everything else for example you can you can actually simulate it if you if you want more abilities you know like for example multiplication and things like that so anyway so this instruction provides uh, some basic things like memory reads writes those are actually assembly instructions simple arithmetic as additional subtraction logical operations like your ends and ors, and then branching. Branching is like jumping to other instructions because you can't just have sequential code, right? I mean, how do you do loops? So, so anyways, uh, the difference between the, the, the three, you'll find that for 64, the 64 bit version will have a bit more instructions which allow you to operate on bigger data similarly to 120 that's b the basic difference and then and then uh, finally so like i said uh, ras does support the ris5 target and there's actually two of them which is that ris ris32 mac ris32 imc and then those are some of the explanations so i is that base one mar M, M is a multiply, and A is atomic, C compressed. So, so again, what, what this means is that uh, it allows you an option. There would be, for example, if you wanted to build a processor that where you don't care about uh, floating points, which, by the way, Rust does not support, because that one would be F, would be a big F. If you don't care about floating point, you just build your processor. You don't have to rely on somebody who built an entire processor and you only need a little, only a small part of it or something like that. So, yeah, okay, anyways, uh, let's just look at a little bit of code. This is my, this is uh, just sample code uh, that I want to use. So you can actually have a look at some of the some of the output. Yeah, I chose something simple because the output at those intermediate and final expanded layers is actually quite ridiculous. It's hard. It's actually quite hard to read. So it makes you appreciate using a high level language because yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's it's quite a bit. So anyways, because even this small example is quite is quite is quite big. Okay. So anyways, um 
so that is that is example HR output. For example, you'll see that it added a little bit of code there. You know, like for example, the prelude, which you normally don't see, so which is a, actually a convenience that Rust gives you. But automatically adds it there. You'll see create core, for example. We we can access the the core library compiler buildings, which gives you some nice features. Anyway, so what happens uh, during the HIR stage? You got important things like type, type inference, type checking, create resolution. So yeah, the list is not comprehensive. To see it through detail, you actually have to <laughs> look at the, at the HIRT, which is like super, super detailed. And then we'll have a look. Uh, no, actually, no. We won't have a look. It was, it was way too big. And anyways, uh, anyway, what am I skipping? Oh yeah, again, that's that's just the 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 command. If you wanted to actually have a look at it, I mean, it's quite massive, but it sort of gives you some insight into into how things are broken up. So, anyways, um, so the next step is that the HIR is turned into what is called the MIR, which is Medium because it sits between the, high, the HIR and LLVM IR. IR is also an intermediate representation, which is how the LLVM represents the code. So it's like sort of the lowest level. So there's like, yeah, medium. Uh, <clears throat> so there's also, it's also the, the concepts are also simplified even further here where, for example, your matches are removed and your loops are removed, and then you, use, you have to use a go-to, for example, which is actually closer to what, how assembly actually represents it. Anyways, what, what happens uh, on MIR? Something quite important, actually, which is borrow checking, which is like a pre critical part of what makes Rust special, right? The way you actually do many memory management, but at compile time. So that gives you safety. I mean, there's a few things that it checks for. Like variables can be used and initialized or whatever, right? And what else? It does some, some pre-optimization so that LLVM will have an easier time actually doing, doing its own optimization because it understands, because it's Rust, right? It understands itself more than Rust, more than LLVM with will. So yeah, the output is LLVM IR. And then that is example. That is example of what MIR output looks like. Which is, you can tell the the interesting one is actually that BB zero block where you'll see if you have a look there underscore one underscore one is actually your argument. Then what you do that check multiplication. You multiply that two and three, and then there's some magical asset that inserted for you for overflow checking and things like that. So. There we go, and then this is just simple LLMVR IR output. It is quite massive, so I only chose a more sort of meaningful example, which is represents what happens there. If you see there, there's a, there's a multiply there happening, and I, I don't know what extract values does and all of that. It's a whole, I think it's a whole talk <laughs> by itself, but yeah. It was just interesting looking at uh, what it looks like. And then finally, well, almost finally, finally you get to see what the assembly looks like. So if you look at main there, you'll see, uh, I should have put some example code here. You'll see that I was, I was actually giving 1983, which is well, an arbitrary number. And remember, I was, I was, if I was actually giving it, it was an argument to a function call, and then the, that is what's happening. So basically, you take 1983, put it in uh, an, a register called A0, and then you'll see that after that, you actually call a function called square. And then if you ignore some of those things, you'll see the instruction called MUL. That's where the multiply actually happens. So remember that A0, A0 is just, is just one, right? 
what, what, what that does is that into register called A1, put, put the result of the multiplication of these two registers, which is A0. And A0 is what? Uh, 1983. And you can ignore the rest of the detail. The total generated assembly was like 120 lines. And yeah, note that I didn't go as far as doing optimized code because that part I, I don't know, I don't, I don't understand the steps. I thought, okay, no, I will ignore this. Anyways, uh, so the very final step is actually that LLVM takes, LLVM takes that code, generates binaries, and then in the end, it actually does the linking where it takes all of the various dependencies and things like that. There were dozens, even, even with the small examples, and then uh, finally produces a, an executable. And know that this is not the only one, it's not unique. Rust, I'm not sure if it does it now, but it would, with, with the examples that I played with, you would, you would need, actually need a link, a, bi, a link from the GANU tool, tool chain, which is binary utils. So, so yeah, thanks. Um, uh, it was good. Uh, it was, it was sort of easy to learn these things because there's a, there's a guide. It's a RASI guide, which is, which is actually a new project. This I think it was introduced this year. So, I learned some things there, and then I wanted to also give special thanks to RAS Fest Paris for inspiring me to give a talk. And yeah, Rust team is amazing, of course. And yeah, and then Rust intense lights. Thanks for <laughs> to Steve for actually producing that because yeah, it helped with my doing the presentation. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, we don't have time for questions now because we just. Yeah, delayed a little bit. So uh, uh, if you have any more questions, you can find him uh, at the coffee break, <laughs> probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, so please help yourself, have some coffee, has eat something, and thanks. <laughs>